Well, if you could see right now what I'm seeing, and you're going to shortly, you will realize that the chaos continues, but nevertheless, we are making lots of progress. It's been a busy week here, not necessarily for me, but for Javier and Sergio and Fernando, who are here helping, uh, helping me get an irrigation system in the back, which will be predominantly a drip system. Now, I'm gonna, all you sweet mothers out there that always want to mother me, I will be very careful not to trip. I'll be careful to get my hair out of my eyes. <laughs> uh, so please don't, don't worry about that. I will be careful. Pretty soon we'll be able to navigate all of this, this uh, treachery out here without a problem. So without further ado, I'm gonna come down off of these, these steps, which by the way, have not been sealed yet or faced in brick. They will be spectacular <laughs> once they are finished, as will the entire back living room, as I'm calling it. Um, it, it, is, it. I can already see it in my head. I don't know if you guys can see it or not but I can see it in my head. Um, we did, and I should have taken some, uh, some photos of this, Stuart, before it, it started to be dug up, but this gives you an idea of where the irrigation lines will go and the different kind of zones I will have. But over here, you can see kind of I think where the edge of the brickwork is going to be, it was going to be a little bit larger than this. And then because of the irrigation lines, practicalities dictated that we had to compress it a little bit. So this will be the outer edge of what I'm thinking of as the brick rug right here. And that will give me more than enough room around the perimeter here. I've got maybe five feet here around the perimeter so I can have my raised beds here with my peppers. Oh, look, Stuart, it's still here. That spider web that we observed the other day, has it changed? Something on it. It's still there. Um, but I will have more than enough room around the perimeter for my raised beds, for I'm not sure what here in the corner, which will be some kind of, I'm thinking, gray-leaved plant. I might even try to keep my, my olive trees growing and plop them in like I did with the topiaries in the front. I'm still not sure, uh, but I'm not gonna be doing any planting right now anyway. I'll, we'll, I will reserve that until fall. The only staging I'll be doing with plants, I'm sorry, Stuart, you mosquito just- bite, Mosquito bites. The, the only, the, though I have to say the mosquitoes, okay, I'm gonna digress for a minute because the mosquitoes have really not been bad here. I'm, I'm very happy to report, maybe because I don't have so much shady canopy, but this, this may be a problem I have not had historically. It remains to be seen, but yesterday I was scared to death when I was deadheading the candy butterfly, the butterfly candy in the front beds and a little rabbit ran out and it about gave me a stroke. So it may be that I have rabbit issues in the future. I'm not really sure. Um, and <laughs> then yesterday evening, probably because it was so cool underneath all of that cottage garden foliage. On the other side, I was also deadheading and almost had a stroke because the neighbor's cat across the street, Severin, was, was lying down there in the shade and jumped, jumped out at me. So uh, yeah, the garden, the garden can be a dangerous place for many, many reasons. But again, I, I am, I'm, digressing. So back in here, there will be a tree. I did want to tell those of you that live in the Oklahoma City area and those that probably in Texas, now is a great time to find this Silverado sage, or this Silverado sage, rather, the Texas sage. I noticed at TLC, which is a local 
um, independently owned nursery here in the Oklahoma City area. They were advertising them that they've got some of them for sale, maybe not this large, maybe just in shrub form, but nevertheless, they have them because they are so heat and drought tolerant that it's this time of year you will find them, you will find crepe myrtle, you will find, uh, what else will you find? You'll find those kind of plants this time of year in the nursery. And I think it looks great like this, but it would look great as a topiary. And it also would look great just as a hedge. So one of my favorite, favorite gray foliage plants that sometimes I use uh, because I don't know, it gives me kind of a lavender look without being lavender, which I find difficult to grow here. I cannot wait to be able to plant my beds with vegetables, which I will try to do in a very elegant and edible way in the raised beds over here. And Stuart, look, even in this chaos, I've got, let me show you right here, I'll hold on. But look, look here, I've got some tomatoes back here. So I think that's just very, very fun. And it looks like I'm starting to get maybe a sign of mealybug. I'm not sure. I need to check that out more closely. But I have some tomatoes back here. I think it might be fun to get them growing up on the wall. I just can't wait to start playing. But I can't play until the chaos is done. I do want to show you. Okay, my little sweet topiaries so for little. Christmas. They're not so little. And get ready for, in August, I have declared it topiary month. So get ready with your ideas. Make sure to share on what things you're going to try to topiary that you found when you were shopping from your own garden in the garden center. Um, I'm going to be playing with some topiary ideas I have myself. Hopefully, maybe, possibly, by then, I'll have an irrigation system. I'll have a brick patio and it won't be quite such a mess back here. One can dream. Okay, so lots of stuff has been going on back here. In fact, it was like magic. I was working at the computer the other day. I didn't realize the guys were back here. And when I came, when I pulled my head out and came up for lunch to get something to eat, all of the irrigation ditches were already filled in. It was like magic. I couldn't believe how quickly they had worked. So all the trenches have been filled in. The template, the profile for the great big patio is pretty clear to you now. You can see where we have excavated out some dirt to a depth of about oh, four to five inches. And the profile and the outline that you see here is where this great big brick rug is going to be. So the guys are on a lunch break right now. They will be coming back. Fortunately, this isn't, um, it's supposed to get up to 104 degrees today, but fortunately, this area is typically shady. When it starts getting a little bit too hot on that side, they put up the patio umbrella because obviously as the sun moves from the east to the west, this whole area gets in a little bit more sun. So we will make sure that they stay safe and that they stay hydrated. So it should go fairly quickly once they start the work. So what is the work? Well. Interestingly, there's always little bits of gardening, archaeology, and anthropology whenever you are putting in a new garden. And Stuart, if you would come over here, I, there was some kind of concrete border, not unlike the one that was on the west side that we broke up and tore out. Why this is running down the middle of the yard, <laughs> I have no idea. Great but it looks like it had been some kind of border. How far is it goes, right there? I really don't know. But what we'll do is just tear out whatever area is above the surface where the brick will be, the remainder can stay in place. Then we'll go with a layer of this crushed gravel. Linda, what if it's a pool? Uh, <laughs> well, I, 
I don't think that it's would be a logical. Oh, oh, Stuart <laughs> said, Linda, maybe it was a pool. Well, if it was a pool, it was a very tiny one and in a very strange location. Whatever this was, it was in a very strange location, That's true. That's true. whatever it was bordering. So, so now the next step after we pulverize that and get that out of the way so that it's on gray, then we're going to come back in with some of this crushed gravel. And the crushed gravel will then be the base for the brick and the pavers. I have decided to do a combo of the two. Let's show this one over here. The brick and the pavers that we're going to use. And these are in that brown tone. This guy too? Uh, yeah, just the brick and the pavers. And these are in the brown tone rather than that stark gray tone. So I think it will harmonize and coordinate a lot better. We're going to do this first before we put any kind of brick facing on the steps. There will be, I believe I told you in our last riveting episode, that over here in this corner right here that I am a Japanese maple. And then because I want to reuse some of what I have, this area may be softened and rounded out with some of the Nandina that I have that's parked over there on the west side. And then there's going to just be a long table here. Now, this is a little bit more of Christmas in July. So I think I told you that I'm going to be on the Christmas tour this year. And I was thinking about, oh, where would we have our big Christmas tree without it taking up too much space, without it being in the way, small petite ones maybe in the parlor. Um, the great room would be the obvious place for a large tree. But then I didn't want to do the kind of large tree that I did when my kids were younger. So I told Hubs, I said, I've got a brilliant, a brilliant idea. So what I think I'm going to do is have an inside outside live Christmas tree because I, I've always wanted to have a Christmas tree I could plant later. So I think what we're going to do is on whatever table I have here, I will right in the middle of this window have a big Christmas tree. And it will be all lit and it will be decorated and you'll be able to see it like, as if it's behind the couch. See it from inside the room. It will be lit up, but it'll be outside. And then I can plant the tree later. So it'll be kind of an indoor, outdoor Christmas tree. And I think that's really fun. Don't you think that's fun, Stuart? I can hang things on it for the birds. Let me know your thoughts on that. There's another question for you. Do you think that's a good idea? Because I just thought, oh, that would be so much fun and that window would showcase it just beautifully. That way I also wouldn't have to disrupt or move around, relocate any of the furniture in there. And there would be that much more space and that much more room to navigate for when people come through for the tour. And I know you'll ask, I'm not sure exactly when it is yet, but it, it's in Mesta Park and it will be at the first part of December, I feel certain. So that's what's kind of going on here. I am hoping this week that also we'll get the rain barrel in place and I'll have a better idea of the perimeter and how many and what size of the raised vegetable beds I want. I mentioned it before, but most of the edibles are gonna be around here. On the, on the periphery of the patio in raised beds, and I think that'll be fun. And I have pretty much depth through here. What would you say? I'm not sure how much you just talked about. Okay, yeah, the raised beds. And they may or may not, all of them may or may not be that style. That's something I'm still cogitating on. But from this point, the edge of the patio to the corner, I've got pretty much depth. What would you say that was? 10 feet? Maybe a tiny bit longer, but yeah. Maybe 10 to 12 feet in here. So I'll be able to have a small tree, maybe a small yopon holly or something. Maybe, oh, here comes the guys. They're pulling up. Um, 
maybe one of my olive trees, I'm not really sure. But I came up, I came up as I was walking around and thinking about different things, planning my spring show for the front. And by the way, stay tuned for the next couple of weeks because I'm going to be sharing all of the tulips, the alliums, the amaryllis that I ordered from Color Blends. If you haven't gotten your catalog, I got mine yesterday. If you haven't gotten your catalog yet, go to colorblends.com and they will mail you one. Um, but I think what I'm going to do, because I thought, okay, this might be a good solution. So Stuart, if you will very carefully come over here. A number of you have asked about the Encore Topiaries, and I haven't showed them recently. So I've got two of them, one there and one right there. Now, typically they bloom heavily in the spring and in the fall because Encore Azaleas are our favorite reblooming azaleas. I knew these were pink, but I wasn't exactly sure what color of pink. Happily, it has rewarded me with a very, very sweet bloom. I want to say this is Encore Chiffon. I'm not really sure, but I, I will find out and let you know. But I was thinking in the front, and Stuart, right here, we might want to put in the area around the social patio where I've got those two really large, hi guys. <laughs> you got, go ahead. Uh, Eugenia topiaries. <laughs> Hi, Javier. Javier's back. Here. Go on ahead, Javier. I told him you guys were taking a lunch break. He knows the drill. Um, and I, can I just say that I really missed him when they haven't been here, so it's fun to have them, have them back again. Uh, but in, this is where we might show in the front, Stuart, where the large Eugenia topiaries in pots that are just recessed into the ground those are not frost hardy, so they're going to have to go to the greenhouse. These azaleas are frost hardy, so probably what I'll do is just leave these in their pots and pluck them down into those holes. They'll be ready to bloom in spring, and then when it's past our frost date, last frost date, I can bring back the Eugenias and move these uh, back here again. Now. If it looks like temperatures are really gonna fall off a cliff and it's gonna get extremely cold, then even though by recessing these into the ground, the ground itself will help insulate them in their pots and I will of course mulch them. Nevertheless, come on in Sergio, say hello to everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, I'll put them in the ground and I'll make sure to mulch them. But these will be beautiful blooming in the spring. They will fill the void left by the Eugenias, and I think it will be a brilliant solution. But I started to say is if it gets really, really cold, then since they're still in pots, I can just excavate them out of their, out of their captivity in the holes up front, and I can put them in the garage or even in the greenhouse, depending on how cold it gets. So I think that'll be fun. And I think since they match my color palette in these pinks and whites, I think it'll just be more than fun to have these blooming around the social patio in the spring. So I'm excited about that and excited as, uh, for that as kind of a solution. So these uh, heavenly bamboo nandinas that were already here, those I will probably put kind of around the Japanese maple. The Japanese maple, again, I will not plant until fall. It's just too hot. I may be doing a little bit of in-ground planting on the margins where it's a little bit shadier, but I'm definitely not going to do any kind of real aggressive planting now. So let's come over and check out the guys. So in case you're going to try to do this yourself, Sergio is just using a hard rake and he's putting Sergio this will be maybe two to three inches of gravel by the time you get finished two to three inches of crushed gravel and then the brick and the stone will just lay on top of that and then we'll come back with 
a mixture of, in, of infill with gravel and maybe a little bit of that pot or that uh, soil conditioner that we used up front. So Javier is clearing out whatever the rest of that is. And how about we just take a break here and leave them to it. Okay. So at this point, they have all of the under layer, the sub layer of crushed gravel in place. And then they have drawn a line, a string line across the expanse to make sure that it's all level once it's in place. So they've done one stretch of it there. You can see it in place and they already have a brick and a paver underneath it. And now they're getting ready to do another one. And I imagine they'll do several of those in kind of a grid pattern to make sure that all of them are foot sure and even when they place them. No, we were going to shoot you. We're, we're doing, uh, what's it called? Stop. Time lapse. Time lapse. We're doing, we're doing time lapse. Here, get this. Get this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kayla, tell me about what they're installing now. Uh, so, they're installing a hard, flexible edging. Um, purpose of using this one is to make the curve with. Um, it's easier to work with. It has plastic connectors that you can clip them to curve it where you want it to bend. Unlike metal edging, sometimes you bend it and it, it gives it kind of a little corner or a straight edge. Right. Um, and another good thing about this one is when we're finished, you're not gonna see it. And that's- It'll that, be covered up with your organic matter. Yeah, and that was really important to me. I would guess, is it also less expensive? Uh, yeah, uh, less expensive. Um, it comes in six foot sticks. Um, those little plastic spikes that they're using mm -hmm. um, has to be bought separate. Okay. But uh, price-wise, it'll go down just about as fast as the metal edging does. But the expense on this is not uh, maybe okay. maybe a third of the metal edging. Okay, Stuart, did you show them putting the spikes in? Now, if Hubs looked out here, he'd probably get kind of kind of excited and think, oh, this could have been a swimming pool. This could have been a swimming pool. Instead, it's just going to be a patio with a bunch of pots around it. <laughs> but fortunately, our neighbors across the street just finished their swimming pool, so we'll just use theirs. So Sergio and Javier are here this morning. Say hello, gentlemen. Hi. Hi. And we're continuing to lay the brick patio and you can see the edging that they have put in place and that will all have infill in it later on. And they will finish the brick laying of the perimeter first with the pavers and the bricks, continuing this pattern all the way around. Oh, I love the way the shadows are created from the lattice work. And then what we were doing was just kind of playing to see what it will look like as we begin to establish a pattern for the interior. Now, I always like it when there's a little bit of space in between the bricks rather than one right up against each other. That also makes the brick go farther. Um, and they'll just continue to proceed on that. But they do have to get the perimeter done first so let's just watch the genius of Javier for a moment. Demonstrating how he puts it in place. And I can't believe, gentlemen, that you do this without gloves. I bet your hands are pretty dry by the end of the day. but they're exacting and he pounds them into place to make sure that they're level. And you can see the grid of string that they have run across 
the entire area, making sure that it will all be level. And you'll notice that periodically we're using imperfect brick because I want it to look imperfect, perfectly imperfect. What we're trying to decide on now, I know that I want herringbone, a herringbone pattern in the interior. And what I'm deciding on now is between two different patterns. This one on an angle and this one, which is pretty much straight. This is also a one by one herringbone and this is a two by two. So here's a question for you, which would you execute? I just had Hubs come out and give me his opinion. What we will do or what they will do is actually after the entire surround is in place, which he doesn't have that much more to go, maybe a third to go. Then they'll start laying the herringbone pattern of brick in the interior. There will be some space in between the brick because I like that look better. And the other thing that might be a consideration is I've been told that when you put things on an angle, whether it's tile or brick, that it does make the surface look larger. So, and it, the other reason this might be easier is what we're gonna do is lay the entire brick pattern first and then go back in and remove some brick to drop in the pavers. So this would be choice A, this would be choice B, and stay tuned and you'll see which one we decided on. Well, the work is very exacting to make sure that each brick and paver is level. And it is very labor intensive but I think it will be beautiful when it's finished and worth it. You'll notice that I'm even incorporating some bricks that have the holes in them because it's old brick and it's the color of my house. Some of it actually came off of my house and was rescued from the garage. So the work continues. Well, Javier, it is looking spectacular. It really is. So he is such a craftsman. And look at the artistry with which he has intermingled the bricks with the holes, with the solid bricks and the pavers in a really nice rhythm. And don't forget Sergio, Sergio too is taking a little break because it is about 100 degrees out, you think? Yeah. Yeah. And fortunately, they have mobile shade. So they just keep moving the umbrella around. But it is really looking spectacular. I love the texture of it and the color. And boy, when the infill is in, and it's hosed down, it should be really, really spectacular.